God, it's so often that when we sing, we aim real high. Lord, we want to build our entire lives on you and your love because we do believe so deeply that it is a firm foundation. We want to put our trust in you alone so that we are not shaken in this life. And Lord, we do want to be led towards your people and love. So now, be with us through the power of your spirit as we look at your command to love one another and give us the courage to live that out. We ask that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Feel free to grab a seat. Well, we're in week two of our series, uh, Loving Well, the One Anothers of the New Testament. Last week, Mark kicked off our series by looking at the command to serve one another. And even though that sounds like a very Christian Bible thing, you know, it only shows up twice in the New Testament. But the command to love one another shows up 15 times. The idea for this series comes from a Greek word that means one another. It shows up 100 times in the New Testament in 95 four or five different verses, 59 of them have these commands attached to them. So this morning, we get to look at the command that Jesus gave to love one another that accounts for a full quarter of all those one another commands. Now, why would there be such a disparity between them? Serving one another certainly seems important. Why would a full quarter of them be to love one another? I think it's because it's the kind of thing that stems from the very character of God. I want to show you just a few verses from the uh, letter of 1 John that talks about how foundational love is to who God is. It starts in chapter 4, verse 7. This is John writing, and he says, Dear friends, let us love one another. That's one of those 15 instances. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. You pause there with me for a moment. That last three words, God is love, tells us something very important about the foundation and the character of God. You know, in Christian theology, we talk about God as being triune. It's one of those holy mysteries that ends up uh, being quite hard to describe sometimes. But kind of doctrinal language says that God uh, exists in three persons in one essence. And what is unique about that is that it allows God to have always been a person who experiences giving and receiving of love. If God was singular in person, before anything existed, he would have no one but himself to love. And so when he created the world and people in it, they, he would have been almost compulsory for him to create something to love. But our God, because he exists in three persons in one essence, has always had a community to love. So that when God goes to create the heavens and the earth and fill it with people, he isn't making something he needs to experience love. He is inviting us in to this love story that has existed from the dawn of eternity. And so it makes sense that because God is love at his core, that the command to to his image bearers, to love one another, would show up so frequently. But John isn't done here. Just two more verses in this letter. It says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. John is saying that it's not just that God is love all the way down to his core. Because God is love to his core. He acts lovingly all the time. So that when you and I are interested in becoming people who love one another, we look to how God loves. And this text is quite clear. It says, this is love, not that we loved God. He's not saying that, hey, just look to your right and your left, see how people love each other. And that's the definition of love. John is saying, look to God, look to Jesus and how he loved his creation. And take your marching orders from there. So as we look at this command this morning to love one another, we're tapping into something deep and foundational about the very character of God. It's one of those things that just is the way God is. But, uh, and as disciples, you know, we, we spout that all the time. We have a, a mission statement here to uh, make disciples who live and live like Jesus. One of the founding principles or core, you know, ideas of what a disciple is, is that a disciple does what their teacher did. So for you and I, if we want to be disciples of Jesus, we must do what Jesus did. 
Just like the early disciples, when they saw Jesus feeding the hungry, what did they want to do? Feed the hungry. When they saw Jesus healing the sick, what did they want to do? Exactly what Jesus was doing, healing the sick. Even things that seem like they should just be Jesus kind of things, like casting out demons. When the early disciples saw Jesus doing that, they said, we went in on that. And they set their hand to casting out demons. They wanted to do everything Jesus did, no matter what it was. Have you ever wondered why Peter walked out on the water? It wasn't just so that he could brag to his friends and have a great story. He sees his teacher, Jesus, walking out on the water and says, if Jesus is walking on the water, I want to do everything Jesus does. So Jesus, call me out and I'll try to walk on the water too. Peter wanted to do the impossible just because he saw Jesus, his teacher, doing that. And so for you and I, if we are interested in being disciples of Jesus, if we see Jesus loving, we ought to love too. Now, my title for this sermon this morning comes from a verse in Romans that I want to read to you quickly. It reads like this. It says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. And so my title this morning is advice that you should only follow in this area of your life is always carry debt. Now, uh, my wife and I have been pretty responsible with debt over the years with the one exception that we have incredibly expensive brains. We have a couple of sheets of paper. They're called diplomas that if you hung them on a wall in our house, it would kind of double the value of the house. And for years, we had to pay down this outstanding debt. We dreamed of the day one day that happened a couple of years ago that we would pay off all that debt. But when we were under that debt, when we owed it, every penny that came in felt like it should probably go to pay for the debt. So that if we got a raise or a bonus, it wasn't, hey, let's go on a great trip or let's take a fancy vacation or buy something extravagant. It was, I guess we write this to Sally Mae. When you are under a debt, everything that comes in feels like it maybe should go towards that debt. Paul knew that. And that's the kind of feel that Paul is invoking in that verse when he says, let no debt remain outstanding except the debt to love one another. And he actually makes it even higher. He says, if you love one another, you fulfill the law. Those 613 written rules that you're supposed to follow simultaneously all the time. He says, if you love, you fulfill the law. And so this morning, We want to feel that same burden. Now, and what's wild is, I don't actually remember when I was in debt paying off my school loans, having any happiness about it. It just kind of felt like a chore. It felt like maybe like a terrible decision, like what was I thinking, you know, when I took on this school debt. But the way that Jesus talks about fulfilling this debt of love, you know what he says? It's wild. You got to love Jesus for just these remarkable things. He says, I am going to tell you to pay down this debt forever so that my joy is in you and your joy may be complete. So even though we're about to talk about something that will sound compulsory, it sounds like a command. On the table for us is having the joy of Christ in our hearts and having our joy be made complete. So other than that, it's not really a big deal. But... (laughs) We are wading into something extremely important in the Christian faith. So the way we're going to divide our time this morning is we're going to look at some teaching from Jesus. We're going to look at one small but profound idea from John. And then we're going to ask the question, did the early church live this out? So some teaching from Jesus, an idea from John, and then did the church do it? So we'll pick up in John 13 verses 31 and 32. First, hear the words of Jesus. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. Now, this text, you may not know where we kind of are in the life and teaching of Jesus, but what has just happened is almost all commentators agree that this is the starting of what is called the farewell discourse. Jesus has been building up his ministry and now he pivots his life toward its end. He has his eyes towards Jerusalem where he will go to be arrested 
and crucified and resurrected from the grave. And as he's thinking about the end of his life, and he's thinking about his physical departure from this world, he wants his disciples to know what is expected of them. And right out of the gates, he starts to mix some terms together. He refers to himself as the Son of Man. That was not a new term. If you look all throughout the Old Testament, you'll see references to the Son of Man. And you'll see them referenced to victorious images, coming in the clouds of heaven on chariots, winning great military victories. When you read Son of Man in the Old Testament, it meant power and clear victory. What's interesting is in the New Testament, Jesus will take that same term, put it on himself as the Son of Man, that one who would gain a victory. But every time he used the term Son of Man in the New Testament, he talked about marching towards the cross, something that was seen as utterly shameful and would have not communicated victory in that time. And so what Jesus is doing as he's about to talk to us about love is squishing together two ideas in one term. The idea of victory and suffering and service. Son of man was being reconfigured. That if you wanted to follow Jesus, followed in the son of man's footsteps, it wasn't just riding in on chariots and victory. It was taking the lowly road of humble service toward neighbor. So Jesus grabs our attention. He says, as I obey God all the way to the cross, God will be glorified. But for all those Jesus included who trusted wholly in God, they too would be glorified. What's wild is the same offer is on the table for Christians, that those who trust in God this fully with their whole lives will be risen one day too. They too will be glorified. And as we obey, God is glorified. This is what Jesus is inviting us into. He goes on. He says, my children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. You see that he really is kind of turning the corner and saying to his disciples, I'm going to leave. I'm not going to be around. And I have some expectations for you. Anybody who's a parent who has ever left kids home alone knows the importance of what will come out of your mouth after uh, saying, I'm going to be gone for two weeks. That, uh, most of the time, those uh, uh, commands include something like, you know, no parties and make sure to take out the trash. But anybody who's been gone knows that it's very important that you are utterly clear on what you expect. One day, this is 25 years ago now, um, my parents left for their 25th anniversary uh, trip to a cruise around the Mediterranean. And of course, they kind of, they trusted us a lot, like way too much. Sorry, dad. Uh, but, um, but they, you know, they did the kind of like, don't have, they don't have parties and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, you can get trouble, you can get in trouble in a good way too. Like when you're destined to be a pastor like me, um, you know what you do when your parents are gone? When my uh, parents left on their Mediterranean cruise, my youth pastor called me and said, hey, your parents are gone, right? So, you know, youth pastors, beware. He said, your parents are gone, right? I have this friend who's in town from Haiti. He's getting some back surgery. Do you guys have a spare bedroom? Well, my sister and I said, my parents are gone. You can have their master suite. And so when my parents arrived home, I think they had to sleep on the couch because Anyo, our friend from Haiti, had taken up residence in their bedroom and their uh, bathroom. When you leave, you have to be incredibly careful to give very specific instructions about what you expect. So if you would just like to sleep in your own bed when you come home, just make sure to tell your kids that. Jesus is about to leave. He says, I'm only be with you for a little bit longer. I have to go first. He says, where I'm going, you cannot come. That's not mean. That's not a threat. He's not trying to like leave them in the dust. He is just saying, what I'm about to do, I have to do. I have to go first. Where I am going, you cannot come. Now, what is interesting when he said this to the Jews, as that verse references, he said to the Jews, well, you look for me and you won't find me. He leaves that part out when he talks to his disciples. Where he's going, they cannot, they cannot come, but they will come later and they will find him. And where he is going, we all know he is headed to the cross. Only Jesus can die that kind of sacrificial death on behalf of humanity. So Jesus is about to leave. He's ready to give his, you know, no parties and take out the trash instructions. What are they from Jesus? He says this, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, 
everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus, about to depart this world, is giving his farewell instructions, what he expects of his disciples in his physical absence. And he says, love one another. Love one another as I have loved you. Now, what's wild is he, he, he uh, intros this by saying this is a new command. But anybody who knew anything about the Bible knew that the command to love wasn't all that new. You would know Deuteronomy 6.5 that said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You would have known that Leviticus 19.18 said that you should love your neighbor as yourself. You probably would have heard Jesus say that those are the greatest commands. So what's new about this? I think it's subtle but profound. Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. See, what happens in Jesus is that an entire new world order comes in. If you remember back to that, uh, that verse from Romans where it said, you know, always carry the debt of love. And when you love, you've fulfilled the law. When Jesus came in, he issued what theologians call a new covenant. That now acceptance with God wasn't based on the law of following all those commands in the Old Testament. It was based on your love and trust in Jesus. So though Jesus is saying something utterly old, love one another, it's entirely new because this new world order has come to bear. And so Jesus says, this new command is that you love one another as I have loved you. And what's at stake? What does Jesus say will happen if we take this command seriously to love one another? He says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, what's interesting is so often we kind of uh, hear uh, the negative of this, or we kind of take it, I'll tell you what I mean. And I kind of love ruining, you know, uh, sayings people love. You know that St. Francis of Assisi uh, quote, the uh, preach the gospel at all times, use words if, if necessary? I mean, I get that. Like, I think that's cool, right? But I think so many people read that and say, so like what you say is unimportant. Did Jesus use words when he communicated the gospel? All the time. So when we read this, this is just love one another. That's all you got to do. It doesn't mean that doctrine is unimportant. It doesn't get you off the hook of saying, you know, the gospel out loud. What Jesus is doing is elevating how we love one another to such a point that it will be the marker that demonstrates that we are disciples of Jesus. He is lifting it so high. So he's not saying that doctrine and theology is unimportant. He's saying that how you love one another will be the marker. It will add credence to what you believe. Almost done with this scene. Jesus goes on, or actually Peter replies to this command that Jesus gives. He says, Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? It's just like Peter. He wants to do exactly what Jesus is doing, always be around him. Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Now, of course, Jesus is about to predict his death three times. And time after time, the disciples don't get it. Peter wants to go with him exactly right now. And Jesus says, where I'm going, you can't follow now, but you will. What does Peter say in reply? Peter asks, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Peter is saying, hey, if anybody's going to die, it's not going to be my savior. It's got to be me. But Jesus knows he always has to go first. So how does Jesus reply? Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Now, if you know anything about the life of Peter, you know that he would lay down his life for his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus isn't being cruel and trying to call him out on this. But what he's saying is you need to count the cost. You need to be real clear on what you're committing to. And you must accept my sacrifice first. If you don't accept that, all else doesn't mean that much. I have to go first. One commentator said, sadly, good intentions in a secure room after good food are far less attractive in a darkened garden with a hostile mob. At this point in his pilgrimage, Peter's intentions and self-assessment vastly outstrip his strength. Peter, like the brash guy he, he is, says, I'm just going to lay down my life for you. And Jesus says, slow your roll. Three times you will deny me. You'll end up in the right place. But you need a real accurate assessment of who you are. You will flinch in the face of trouble. 
but you'll get there. You will be able to fully live out this command to love one another. So we see the teaching of Jesus quite clearly. My command to you is to love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples. So we've touched on the teaching of Jesus. What's the idea of John that will launch us in to looking at the early church? It's one of these kind of simple but profound ideas. 1 John 4.11 says this. This is John reflecting on the life and ministry of Jesus. He says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No surprise there. We've just talked about that. But then he says this. He says, No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. I think this is one of the most profound ideas in the whole scripture. It's no mystery that no one has seen God the Father. Right? He's invisible, all that kind of stuff. But what John says here is no one has seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete. In essence, what John is saying is no one's seen God, but they've seen you. And the way you live teaches them about what you really believe. The way you live actually is a witness to what God is like. What John is saying is God wants to see what you believe. Maybe what John is also saying is the world around you, your neighbors, your friends, those who don't yet know the love of Christ, they want to see what you believe. Not just hear about it. They want to see what you believe. And so did the early church take up this command from Jesus to love one another? This idea from John that if we love, we will actually make God seen to others. Did the early church do it? Now, spoiler alert, you and I are sitting here, so they probably did, and it probably worked. But I want you to be exposed to just a couple quick quotes from this book called The Rise of Christianity. It's just a study on what it took for a religion to go from nothing to something. It's by a sociologist named Rodney Stark, and he just wants to answer that question. Why does the Christian church exist? And at the core of this long book with a sophisticated argument is that the early church actually loved one another so compellingly that everybody else wanted in on it. Listen to when he talks about his central thesis. Rodney Stark in his book, Rise of Christianity, says this. Let me state my thesis. Central doctrines of Christianity prompted and sustained attractive, liberating, and effective social relations and organizations. Now, he didn't know that I was going to be preaching on it, so he said it kind of academic, but I knew I was going to preach on it. So let me say it a little more simply. The early church actually loved one another so compellingly that everyone wanted in on it. It was that, that, that much of a witness that when the early church set their hand to loving one another, they made their beliefs and their God visible. They let their doctrine determine what they did. Now, how did this unfold? One of the first main innovations, and this will actually sound surprising, one of the first main innovations of Christianity was that God actually loved you. It sounds like something you just kind of take for granted. There was a time when people didn't realize that God could have that kind of relationship with you. Listen to the words of Rodney Stark here. He says this, What was new was the notion that more than self-interested exchange relations were possible between humans and the supernatural. The Christian teaching that God loves those who love him was alien to pagan beliefs. Gods were always interacting with other people in pagan belief systems, but it was always service for sacrifice. The gods were basically saying, you give me some grain, I'll give you some rain. It was this for that. But here, rolls on the scene, a God who loves because he loves. And in his son Jesus, he untethers his love from your performance. He ties it to his performance. So gone are the days, service for sacrifice. The fact that God could love you was utterly new. So it stands to reason that if no one knew God loved them, doing something about that love would have been unthinkable as well. Listen to the second innovation. It says, equally alien to paganism was the notion that because God loves humanity, Christians cannot please God unless they love one another. You see, these core doctrines of Christianity really changed the world. Not only that God loved people, that because God loved people, we ought to love people too. 
So did the early church grab that? Rodney Stark says, yes, these doctrines drove their actions. Listen to this from Rodney Stark. Pagan and Christian writers are unanimous, not only that Christian scripture stressed love and charity as the central duties of faith, but that these were sustained in every day behavior. Gone were the days where you just loved God on the high holy days. This command to love one another, to make everyone know that you are a disciple of Jesus, worked its way into your everyday life. It wasn't just going to the temple once a week or once a year to offer sacrifices. It was woven into how you lived your everyday life. And that led to the growth of the church. Two more quotes from Rodney. Listen to this one. The primary means of its growth was through the united and motivated efforts of the growing number of Christian believers who invited their friends, relatives, and neighbors to share in the good news. This idea that we ought to reach out to our friends, reach out to our family, reach out to our neighbors is ancient. It's actually how the early church grew, is that they were so passionate about loving one another. They were so smitten by the fact that God loved them and that they were then pushed out into the world to love other people. They couldn't shut up about it. And so they just went out to their friends and relatives and neighbors and said, you got to get in on this good news that God loves you and he wants you to love other people. Rodney Stark kind of closes up his argument by saying this. and I love this. I feel like this is one of the things I want to see in our church. Stark writes this. It was the way these doctrines took on actual flesh that led to the rise of Christianity. Christianity isn't just a neat system of ideas. It's a whole way of life. That's why disciples wanted to do what Jesus did, even if it was walking on water. Jesus intends for everything he taught to be enfleshed. You know, there's real power when something that could exist as just an idea, I don't know, say like God, puts on flesh and dwells among us. It changes things. It catalyzes things. It convinces people that that idea is a reality. When Jesus took on flesh and dwelt among us, it was a witness to what God was really like. And you and I today are to follow in the footsteps of that early church who so believed that God loved them and because of that they were to love one another that they actually did it. They wanted that belief that God loved them and they were to love one another to have as much flesh on it as their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did. And so I just wonder what it would look like for you and I to declare today, I want or I am going to put flesh on what I believe. What would it look like that when new people come into this church, that they would just see what we believe? That they would see that we are so convinced that Jesus really taught us to love one another. It had so much flesh on it that that's just what people saw when they walked through the doors. What would it look like in your family if you put flesh on your belief that God loves you and because of that you are to love one another? What would it look like if you were to show up in the world around you, maybe in your workplace, and say, I believe so deeply that God loves me and I am to love one another that I'm going to put flesh on it. It's going to be the way I live my life. Friends, putting flesh on the beliefs of the early church is what made it grow. That's the challenge for you and I today, to so believe that God loves us and that we are to love one another that we actually do it. Amen? Amen. Will you pray with me as we turn towards communion, this act of God wanting us to share in his love for us? Let's pray. Most merciful God, we are blown away by your love for us. We acknowledge that we are invited into that love, but here in these moments, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we've done and by what we've left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not loved one another as ourselves. For that, we are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen.